So I'm a journalist, I'm not a scientist, and it's incredibly intimidating for me to follow one of the world's great scientists on climate, uh, you know, in, in when I'm just a journalist. So, just listen, I, I have not done this. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm feeling a little humbled by all this, but I'm going to give you the because I talk a lot about this stuff and because my field is writing about the ocean. So I've, I, I've written uh, quite a lot about climate change, a tremendous amount actually about climate change. My first book is about that. But I was right at the end of that book when I realized that I knew nothing about the global ocean and what was happening in the global ocean. And I just, it sort of launched me on this quest globally that took me, you know, two and a half years of research and 13 major journeys and ended up in this book called Seasick, which I'm shamelessly holding up because my agent will kill me if I don't. Um, and Seasick has become an international bestseller, which is incredibly rare for a Canadian science book. Um, and uh, so I want to tell you about, I'll, I'll give you the, the sort of the, the 10 minute, I think if I got 10, if I got 10 <laughs> minute uh, little precy of the f sort of facts and figures you need to know in order to be literate about some of the stuff that's happening to the global, to the global ocean, um, which of course has to do with climate change. And I would argue that it's actually more important than what's happening to the atmosphere. What's happening to the ocean I think is, is a more immediate threat. So here is my 10 cent, uh, 10 minute, we know, as we've already heard, that before um, before we started putting, when we, when, we, when we burn fossil fuels, what we're doing, of course, in, in just simple terms, is putting the carbon that was stored in the bodies of ancient plants and animals into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide gas. So we're putting ancient carbon that was not from our era into the atmosphere. And before we started doing that in a big way, as uh, Lauren was mentioning, we had about 280 parts per million by volume of CO2 in the atmosphere. So a tiny little bit of CO2 in the atmosphere. But of course, what it does is allow for life on the planet. It allows for warmth on the planet and for us to survive. And this, of course, was created um, as an offshoot of uh, well, I, I don't need to get into that. So 280 parts per million by volume. Today, uh, I think it's 387. That's the figure that I've... But it, it's in this range, 387 parts per million by volume. That's since the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so this is in a very, very short time. In geological terms, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, um, in geological terms, if anything happens, uh, anything that happens within 10,000 years is considered instantaneous. This has happened in about 150. Okay, we know for sure, as I understand it, that it hasn't been above 300 parts per million by volume for 20 million years. So we're at a very, very unusual state in the planet's history, okay? About a third, it's only, it's at 387 now, because about a third of that ancient carbon that's gone into the atmosphere has been absorbed into the global ocean. And as um, Danny was saying, this is, this is, just, a, this is just basic chemistry. As it, goes, as it goes into the atmosphere, it will be absorbed into the global ocean. There's no way of stopping that absorption. And when it gets absorbed into the global ocean, across the surface, this membrane, membrane of molecules that connect the air to the water, as it gets absorbed into the, into the ocean, it creates a mild carbonic acid. Except that we've had so much CO2 go into the ocean that it's actually lowered the pH of the whole surface portion of the global ocean, which is to say about 3,000 meters, so most of the depth of the global ocean. So what does that mean? It means that before we started doing, putting all this stuff in, the pH of the global ocean was 8.2, open ocean. Today, as I understand it, it's 8.05, which as I understand it, is the lowest it's been in at least 55, million years. Okay, so this is, it hasn't been above 300 for 20 million years. It hasn't been this low in 55 million years. We are at a very unusual point in the planet's history. Okay, so where does it go from here? Just to, this, by the way, I should explain that that, uh, that the pH scale is a logarithmic scale. So it's like a cyclone, big at the top, small at the bottom. And uh, even a tiny little change in that pH scale is a major change for life that is living in this, in, the, in this medium, okay? So this represents a 30% decrease in pH just since we started burning all this ancient carbon, 30%. So where does it go after this? What, what does pH mean? What do you think pH, has anybody here had a fish tank? <laughs> anybody here had a fish tank? 
So what, well, pH is one of the things you monitor, right? And what happens when the pH goes wonky? The fish, yeah, the fish die. They, they belly up, right? That, and that's, what, that's what happens. It's the same phenomenon that's happening in the, in the global ocean. This is a new, <coughs> newly understood phenomenon. As I understand it, the very first paper on this came out in 1999 in Nature. Okay, so this is something that, and, and I talked to one of the scientists, she was named in the, in the, the paper, you just showed up there, Joni Kleipas, when it, you, the one that said six C's, the, the scientist who was mentioned in that paper at the beginning is Joni Kleipas, who works for NOAA, which is the, excuse me, the uh, National <laughs> Oceanographic, wait a minute, National Atmospheric and Oceanographic Organization in the state, so that's the scientific body of the US government. So she works for them, and she's in Colorado, and she was actually at a, at a conference with a bunch of other biologists in about 1998. And they were literally working on the back of, of envelopes, trying to figure out what was happening, what, what is the chemical reaction between CO2 in the atmosphere and water. And they realized that it meant, you know, that, it would, that, that, that there is carbonic acid in the, in the ocean and that the pH was lowering and that ha is having a huge effect on calcium in the ocean. And she literally, as she was figuring this out with all these other scientists, literally ran to the bathroom and threw up at the implications of this. The implications are not just that it can corrode shells, just like, you know, if you put an egg or a bone in a, you know, in a, in a bottle of vinegar. It's not just that. It's that the, ca the calcium that is in, s in solution in the water, in the ocean water, the calcium that's needed to make skeletons for whales, calcium that's needed to make shells or clams, shells for coccolithophores, the, the little things that Danny was just showing us on the screen. They can't get at the calcium easily in order to make their shells. So they can't make their shells. They spend more energy trying to create all that stuff. And, and at some point, it becomes the, the water becomes acidic enough that it actually begins to corrode the shells. Okay, so what does that do if you're an embryo? What does it mean? I mean, so for the first time now in the last two or three years, there's a tremendous, and the US government has just launched a huge research program on this phenomenon of ocean acidification. And they're looking at what happens to embryos, what happens to sperm motility you know, of creatures in the ocean, what happens to spawning ability of creatures. All of these things are, are you know, understood to be impaired in an ocean that is more acidic. So they're just, they're all of these knock-on effects that, that scientists are just beginning to understand. The basic phenomenon is that as the ocean becomes more acidic, creatures cannot maintain their own internal body chemistry. That's the basic issue. So this is the big one. This is like the big issue. This is the one that nobody is really talking about in the, in the global discourse. David McDonald is in the audience I see here. And uh, Joy Kennedy and we were at Copenhagen um, at the talks on uh, climate in December and this issue, ocean acidification, which is linked intimately to CO2, was not on the agenda formally. We were, David and I were at a side event um, organized by a bunch of ocean scientists and uh, where the, the message was, please, please take this into account when you're taught, when you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about CO2 in the atmosphere, because it's not just in the atmosphere, it's also in the ocean. And this is a big shift, because for years, scientists which were saying, oh, isn't it great the ocean's absorbing all that CO2, so we are only at 387. Isn't it terrific, right? Big buffer zone. And now, of course, they're realizing that this is the big issue.